for this show, because this is a, a rare event that we have actual human people <laughs> with us, um, I'd like us to do um, a, a short Q&A at the end, perhaps, um, which is always, whenever I go to an event, the most embarrassing part of any event, and I usually run away. But if you could stick around and perhaps ask us questions uh, to do with the things that maybe we've just been talking about. Um, we'll be recording straight through in, in the start that we normally do, and it's about 45 minutes. And, um, and I shall... S uh, now... This is slightly nerve-wracking. You can imagine if you work in radio, you, you don't have an audience. And to have an audience and to perhaps see uh, facial expressions when you say something <laughs> completely silly would be extraordinary. Yeah. So just, sure, perhaps just, uh, uh, paralyzing. So forgive well, me. One, just ignore them. And two, if you really must, imagine they're all naked. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please don't... Don't, uh, don't take your clothes off. Yeah. yeah don't, anyway. No, uh, no, no. Don't be inhibited, please. Uh, 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 clap for us or jeer if you hear things you don't like and so that at least the, the radio audience will know that we're not faking it that this is <laughs> truly a live audience yeah okay. yeah exactly okay. you ready that. Ali, okay. ready go Stop uh -huh. on. hello and with me cam Ruslan today we have um well first of all i should say where we are this is a special issue of um, a bit of culture where we are recording in the ilham gallery at uh, Manara Ilham, which is the third tallest building in Kuala Lumpur, I have been told. And uh, there is uh, an exhibition here, uh, which is about the uh, art and culture of Malaysia Kuala Lumpur um, since 2009 to 2017. And um, BFM has been included in this show. So we are representing BFM at this show. and. Uh, and I'd like to just prove, first of all, that we are, in fact, in front of actual human people, uh, an audience, most of whom have elected to be here of their own free will. <laughs> and if I could just ask, perhaps, if the audience, could you just... Um, applaud. Applaud, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, no pressure to our two guests. <laughs> Today uh, we have the return of one of the founding fathers of A Bit of Culture, BFM's very own Shirad Kutan. Always a pleasure. Uh, and we have the return of um, curator of the Georgetown Literary Festival, but now, more importantly, with her first novel, Bernice Chorley. Hello. I love the show. I love the show. Right. Well, Bernice's book is fresh out and we will be talking about that in a moment. But our three topics this week will be, topic number one is, should we even bother to know the news? Topic number two is 100 stations and the- I think it's called the train station. Train station and global storytelling. And finally, uh, topic number three, Bernice and creating characters. Hmm. So, topic number one, um, should we even bother to know the news? I have been away from Malaysia for three weeks, and I just got back. And in the three weeks that I've been away, I've barely looked at Malaysian news. And it has been fantastic. <laughs> um, I feel so much better for it. And I am now back, I just got back yesterday, and I'm, I'm preparing to re-immerse myself in Malaysian news watching. And I imagine that when I open up my computer and look at the websites, it's going to be like the, the final scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark and, you know, with face melting and head exploding as I look at the full horror of, of what we have. But I'm wondering, should I even bother? Sh is there anything to be gained by knowing, to really knowing everything that's going on? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I choose to not look at Malaysian news all the time because it's, 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 you know, you wake up in the morning, you want a cup of coffee, you put some music on. The last thing I want to do after that is to read the local news. So I don't. I just don't. But Bernice, I mean, the, the question is, is the Malaysian news exceptionally bad? I mean, world news is bad enough. Mm. We have the trenches, yes. the Korean Peninsula. We have that story of that uh, handsome Iraqi art college student who was murdered just because he was handsome uh, by some fun fundamentalists. I mean, and it, you can go on with the yeah. global news, which is equally toxic mm -hmm. and uh, full of really 
you know, stories that suggest to you that the human person can't be redeemed, that the human species, rather, can't be redeemed. Yes. But, Sherrod, you are in the business at BFM of news gathering. Pity me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so every morning I aggregate news for uh, our listeners, and, you know, I'm filled with levels of toxicity that will... Uh, you know, pay dividends in my in my 60s. With, I guess my knees will go, my liver will you know shut down, and my brain will turn to mush. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping to be compensated handsomely now because the future is rather bleak. But yes, I do it because, in some sense, we need to frame the news. We need to frame this tox this toxic news. I mean, to the extent it's toxic, there's some good stuff out there too. And sometimes you get to talk about stuff that makes you feel that the that the human uh, you know that the human species can be redeemed that in fact we are not as hopeless and uh, yeah, but, mean but and Shrat, as a, as a news curator that's not actually news well some of the good stuff is i mean okay give you know, me all, give me, give me 10 minutes news. to remember the the happy news from the last week but um, yes in the meantime Bernice, you can talk yeah okay so i don't because google you know I, I like things to stay the same i'm a creature of habit so google news recently changed its 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 look and that was a real deterrent i'm like no i don't like this anymore so Yes, I, I don't read the news, but I am on, on social media. And inadvertently, you will see friends and you know, people who will post various things about the news. So you are forced to read things that you are you know, slightly piqued by. I go straight to the Guardian page, I go to the Arts and Culture page, and I click on te uh, television, radio, books. That's the, so that's the kind of news that I would like to but read. But isn't that cowardice? Isn't that cowardice? Well, yes, and so what, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with cowardice? Okay, so generally seen as a bad news. thing. But I ask you, even if you did stop reading the news, the hard news in particular, would, you, would it stop people from around you from talking about it? I mean, who can get away from talking about Kim Il-sung or, or a Donald Trump or, you know, or even, you know, Brexit, you were recently in, in Britain. I mean, people will continue to talk about what is in the news. So, so what, you, sorry, what you're saying is, one, we will be contaminate, contaminated whether we like it or not, and two, we will be informed whether we like it or yes. not. In a, yeah, yeah so in, in a nutshell, yes. Yeah. I mean, but you're going to be dragged into it because it's you're in it. You're not outside of it. There's no shutting it off. It's not like you a television. Shut it off zone. If you shut off the internet, if you get offline, then you are really, really sort of. But Bernie's contained. Your your new novel. Uh, yes. Once we were there. There. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to read the cover upside down. <clears throat> um, it, it's set in the 90s during Reformacy period. So you were in. The, the news, as it were. Mm -hmm. No, you weren't in the news, but you were involved with everything that was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. and, so was Sherrod. All right, but, it, yes. but, yeah, but you, it informed you, it excited you, and you've now created a, a, a book out of it. Mm -hmm. But you've just said you've, you've opted out of today, so uh -huh. you've got nothing to you say about choices. today? You have choices. I think, you know, I, I chose to write about this particular time there was, because there, there is nothing, apart from, I think, a book by Faisal, Faisal Tehrani, about the Malaysian Reformacy. It was, a, it was an intriguing time, it was a tumultuous time, it changed a lot of us. I think a lot of us are who we are now because of what happened in 98 and because we were on the streets, we were there supporting Anwar, we were angry, we were angry. So, it, and it's because we suffer from political, historical amnesia, I really wanted to write about a, a time, you know, especially for the millennials, right? A lot of, a lot of you weren't, uh, were still in diapers when, when we were running the streets and getting tear gassed. Um, I wanted to write about this very, very important, pivotal time in Malaysian history. Yeah, and that's why it yeah. says for mature audiences only on the cover. Absolutely. But I, no, I must say, you know, there was Sabri Zane's book as well. Yes. Yeah? Yes, and and that diary. was, you know, came out of a blog he ran mm -hmm. that documented, you know, almost day kind of day, day yes. account of what was happening. Yeah, as well. But yeah. my point is, yes. so there you were getting involved with and being excited by those times, but now you've... You, Will you have nothing to say about now? Do you not care about now? Of course I do. I care about the now. But, I, you know, then we were part of the news. The whole country was, was you know, the, the, the world spotlight was, was on, on, on our... On, you know, we had, we had some of the best journalists in the world in KL. The trial was written about. I mean, it was... I think we were fueled by anger because we believed that we could change the country. It was about change. It was about us putting ourselves in the news to get what right. we, yep. we thought we could get out. Yeah. Of By the way, but you, know? you keep you keep saying we we. Yes. You know, uh, don't don't worry, Cam, hang on. All right. Okay. <laughs> this okay. This is the other side of it, right? I think what I understand what Cam is saying is that if you now distance yourself from contemporary political dynamics, are you then robbing yourself of the possi yeah. possibility of okay. engaging with it in you know in the future? But 
uh, I mean, the, the, the other side of it is, yes, I mean, in some sense you do, but I think you can engage without being, you know, overwhelmed by yeah. it, I think. But, yeah. but okay, okay. Are you talking about Malaysian news, are you talking about news in general? I mean, talking about the, you know, sort of keeping tabs of, on Trump, you're keeping yeah, tabs on Trump, the G20. Yeah, but Trump, that's entertainment. For Malaysians, that's just, that's just entertainment. What do, we, what, what do we really care if they, he's removed 20 million people from healthcare? I, you know, really, what do we care? We've got nothing to do with us. <laughs> hmm? Well, I would disagree. I, Never mind. That's well, I mean, I feel, I feel sad for them, but at the same time, you know, emoticon sad face, but, you know, mm -hmm. really, well, anyway, we must move on, but I just want to say very briefly, though, where we are right now in Ilham Gallery, surrounded by artwork that has been created from 2009 to 2017, the baleful years of Malaysia's existence, it's actually quite inspiring to see that people are still engaged and are creating um, exciting and interesting work, so I just want to add that. But we're going to move on, though. Yes. We'll move on. Yes. All right, hang on. To topic number two, charade, 100, no, just train, train stations. Station. But the, you know, the reason you keep saying 100 is because there were 100 directors uh, that participated in the, the making of this film. How many of you here actually saw, uh, watched uh, 100, sorry, a train station? Anybody here? Nobody. Absolutely. One. One person. So, so, so we can get some feedback from you perhaps after the show. But the, the point of this is it was an attempt at creating a global story. And as you see that, and if you guys are on Netflix, you would have um, maybe watched Sense8 by the, uh, the Wachowski sisters, uh, formerly the Wachowski brothers of Matrix fame, uh, who've tr really tried to put together a global story. And I was thinking, uh, you know, that's an interesting conundrum for contemporary you know, uh, creative, uh, you know, writers and filmmakers and such is that the idea of creating a global story, I think, and this, and I would contrast it with perhaps the fact that in, you know, plays, Shakespearean plays perhaps, or the novels of, of uh, those from the 18th and uh, 19th, uh, sorry, 19th and 20th century, um, were were universal in character. So you think of a movie or a novel, very specific in place. And the characters conform to the reality of that uh, very specific place, and um, and they tell a story, but a story which we can all uh, identify with. And that's and be engaged. That's right. So then we call that. You know, we talk about the the character of universality in a story that might be very of that sort. But here, what you had is. Um, so across many different uh, backgrounds, right? So a hundred different scenes, as it were, or, or places. In 25 different countries. 25 different countries. This, uh, the same character, but different actors. So you expect to, uh, to follow through with the story and the characters. It, it, even as they change, they go from Mumbai to um, Dubrovnik. Or I'm, I'm making this up. But they go to many places. Now you, after a while, you just forget who they are. Because they're not told. You're not told, oh, no, you're now in Iran. Because there was a segment from Iran. Um, and which reminds me, the segment from Iran was so superbly acted, where segments from other parts, uh, other contributors were so poorly acted. So the, the thing that happened was it was very uneven and that's why I felt that the film in some ways uh, failed. But it had some interesting um, um, strategies. One, it, they were looping around so the same part of the story get told more than once. You had these segues, all of which added up to this rather ambitious attempt to tell a global story. But, what, uh, but, what but it, it failed, I think. So it was not successful. In my eyes, it wasn't. D does that mean my friend fell asleep after twenty minutes? So right. I, you know, I braved through it. But does that mean then that the, the the endeavor of trying to tell a global story is doomed to failure? I don't know. I mean, that's something for anybody who watches it. You know, you kind of say, does it? It's like a Hollywood, a Bollywood, uh, you know, musical thing where they they're dancing in Mumbai and suddenly they're in you know in Switzerland and then the backdrop keeps changing. Didn't except you? they. Sorry, didn't you say there was a Malaysian element? In yes, this? there was a Malaysian right. element. And, and that was interesting because when I watched the Malaysian element, I thought to myself, it doesn't quite work. It's not really true, you know. And, uh, but, but for the other scenes, I, I would know because, you know, I'm not really involved in those. So I, I can't really tell, right? But to, I, uh, the way I would, I would approach this is for me, it's, uh, it's trying to disrupt uh, uh, genre storytelling. This kind of linear storytelling that we are used to. That's you know, right. we, we have a beginning, middle, and an end. We have one character, we a protagonist we follow. Well, that, that linear, such. that general template is still there, except it's not so uh, not as linear as it is. So the looping around does break that. But generally, you, you're moving. There is a plot. So, so is, is, a plot. It, is it not? I mean, Bernice, you've just written a book, and you are, you're a poet by background. Mm -hmm. But your, your work is traditional, 
linear. Character driven. Character yes, driven. Yes. Mm -hmm. Three act structure. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you. Are we, are we going? To, are we segueing into my? my no, we are now? not. But I'm just <laughs> asking. <coughs> this is not a chance to promote your book. Not yet. Oh, the, not the yet. Everything's a chance to promote okay. your book, Bernie. <laughs> but I mean, uh, would you be able? To, could you see yourself sort of breaking up structure so much and, and doing it's, jumping it's, all over the place like, like this? It sounds like I'm not familiar with, with this. this Have you seen Sense Eight? Yeah, I watched the first couple of episodes. You, you weren't no, impressed. No, no. no. Okay. I mean, I mean, it's it's. It's trying to tell a global story in that it's it has characters in different parts of the world. So there's one in Korea, there's one in, I think, in, in South Nigeria, America, Nigeria, in, in Africa, and so on and so and forth. Mom, mom, mom. Um, but I think it's it's very, it's it's difficult. It's difficult because you're trying to create sort of linear narratives from sort of cross-cultural characters. Um, you have to have an understanding of the context of, of where these people are at, and then to create sort of you know stories that, that are meaningful, are engaging, and I think see, some see, of it works. This is where I think there's a, the, what it gives up is that that mm -hmm. meaningfulness of the specific place right. in which the actors. Right. In fact, the the point of global storytelling, at least these strategies, is to pretend that uh, the the site is not important. So it, it, yeah, so that it's not tokenistic. It's like oh, let's have a character from so, from South Korea or North Korea or whatever, just because it's. Yeah, in and some news. ways they all kind of meant, they kind of like conform to what cosmopolitan think, uh, cosmopolitans mm. think of the world. So in some ways, culturally, it's actually quite homogenous. Though, it, but the costumes change, the background, the, some of the language, you know, the cityscape changes. But actually, the values are quite cosmopolitan and mm. quite uh, homogenous. And I think the other thing is, in Sense8, they attempt to find coherence globally by saying that all these characters share the same minds space right right and so you have these kind of fantastical moments where all the characters are actually in the same space and doing very naughty things together but okay so the erotic is actually the coming together you miss you you should have stayed beyond <laughs> episode two they've canceled the the series haven't they no yes they well, have. well the season two's out but no, they've, okay. they've okay. Canceled the series. We, we, we must move on though but so Sharad, if uh, if you were if there was train stations two and if it was much more erotic, yes, I would watch it. Okay. <laughs> all right. But can you give a, a blanket sort of thumbs up, thumbs down to translation? Well, I, would I you think say we yes should them? all watch movies like that. I, should, I think we should w uh, look at things, um, artwork or films or what, but read novels that are ambitious, you know, in their intention. They fail, they fail. But I think it's worth putting that money down for something yeah. like that because something good yeah. might come oh, especially out if it helps of you, it, you helps know, you down the get road. away from reading that's, the news for sure. Well. That's... Um, <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do with, with the next novel. So oh, oh. Think of she, this space and promoting... the artworks here. I mean, they're not all <laughs> successful, I don't think. Sharad, she's promoting the next book, <laughs> she, let alone the first one. So, but uh, we, sh we must take a break now. And uh, in a moment, we shall return to Ilham Gallery and a bit of culture here on BFM 89.9. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Is that okay? No, no, no. I'm not speaking into the mic. Okay, here. Huh? So... Is it? Um, so we, 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 that's, then there's commercials, uh, commercials, 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 BFM has commercials. Yes. It does. Um, yeah. Ali? Good. Right. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start again now and we'll do one more topic, which is going to be Bernice's topic and recommendations, mm -hmm. and then we'll do a Q and A. Could I ask though, could I ask that at the beginning of this, uh, episode, at uh, this episode, this section, we, we start with a round of applause. Yes? So, um, just no, I mean, this is just so that the, the people listening know that... You're still with us. Yeah. And you haven't abandoned the space. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Bernice, you just turned your book. Oh, my God. I'm a Virgo. It's, it's <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> this is incredibly narcissistic, but I'm going to do it anyway. Could you clap now? <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. And we're back in Ilham Gallery. Thank you, people. Uh, with a bit of culture, uh, with my guests today was me, Cam Raslan, Sherrod Kutin, and Bernice Chorley. And now, Bernice, topic number three, creating characters for your new novel, Once We Were There. Right. Um, as Arundhati Roy says, I mean, the folks in my book, the folks in my book, and this is a term that, that I really didn't quite understand until I started writing this novel. Um, I've written five books. A lot of my work is actually very personal. Um, the, the sort of memoir, which is about my family, I trace back 100 years of, of the family of the Chorleys and the Lowe's coming to Malaya. 
Um, I started as a poet, so my work is, is extremely personal. So this was something that I really wanted to try and do. I mean, to make the leap from poetry to the novel is, is huge, you know. It's a, it's a, the words conspire in a, in a completely different way. So what I, I suppose I want to talk about the folks in my book include um, the city of KL. I really wanted to sort of to write about a city, to give it some sort of, to give it life, to give it breath, to give it texture. Um, and so it looks at KL from multiple viewpoints. Um, the main characters are Del, Della Nix Regea. She doesn't have a race. Um, she's named after the flame of the forest, so the Latin name Della Nix Regea. Um, she falls in love with Omar, who is half English, half Malay. Um, the other main character is a transgender uh, sex worker from Sabah. There are also sort of, you know, multiple characters. And she, she's a journalist in a magazine called The Review, right? Um, she documents um, the streets. Uh, and actually, I used one of your pieces that you wrote for Saxi. So Saxi is in the book. Uh, there she's a lot pointing of, at Sharad there. There's a lot of, um, there are there a lot of uh, facts in, in, in the novel. But creating these characters was something that I had a lot of difficulty with, finding the voice, finding the, the, the texture of, of the, the physicality of the person. And, um, you know, so I worked on, on the first draft. It took me three years to write the first draft. And in the last four years, I've basically been revising the novel. Um, and as a poet, not a novelist, I, mean, I can call myself a novelist now, but a year ago, I decided to work with a, a wonderful writer, a very respected Malaysian novelist called Chua Guat Eng. And the most extraordinary thing was this, that I realized that in order for a piece of fiction to work, your characters have to, to be real. They have to live in the world. You have to be able to talk to them, to touch them, to sit in your car and have a conversation with them, say good night to them when you're going to, to, to bed. Um, and I, I'm in love with my characters. Okay, yeah. I miss them now. I Our, miss them now that the okay. book is done. I'm like, oh my God, what do I do now? Bernice, you know? Bernice, Bernice. Bernice you mentioned <laughs> Review. And when Bernice mentioned Review, she was actually alluding to uh, a magazine that we all were involved in at some point in time in the mid-90s called Men's Review. And that, and that was also quite a groundbreaking mm -hmm. magazine. It was a men's magazine, but attempted to do, uh, you know, uh, substantial, uh, you know, well, issues as well as the fluff and laddish stuff. But the important thing is that there are, there are autobiographical elements in yes, your book, absolutely. right? And I, I was going to mention this because my mother's first novel called The Tessellated Path is a semi-autobiographical novel. Mm -hmm. and, and she asked me to read it, you know, she, with some trepidation because she knows her son will be very honest with her. I said to her, you know, mom, you didn't allow your character uh, to break free from you. Mm. That, you know, the, the mm. foundations of your yes. character was yourself, mm -hmm. uh, but she didn't come into her own. She, you know, you really should have let her go. Yeah. And I wonder if that's part of the problem, letting go of these these facts and allowing them mm -hmm. to bloom into something no, more absolutely, more absolutely. Substantial. And it's a process. It, it's, it's actually quite painful because you have this idea of who your female protagonist should be. And, you know, Del is not strong. She's very flawed. I mean, I think some of the readers, some of, some of the readers who read the book will be shocked at the kinds of things that she does. Um, so it's about people who are lost in KL, you know, people who try to survive, some do, some don't. But I think at the, you know, at the heart of it is really about this city. I think KL is one of the most fascinating places on the planet. I love this city and I really wanted to sort of bring it to life in, in a way that, mm. that I've never done before in, in, in all the writing that, that I've done. But at the same time, right, I've lost my train of thought now. Well, I was, can I, at this point, <laughs> issue a correction. I use the word trepidation just in reference to my mother. My mother is fearless. There was no trepidation. She just thought, okay, here it is, son. You read it. Tell me what you think. Well, can I offer some trepidation then? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it just so happens yes. that, well, I'm a writer too. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been writing a book recently, which I'm a bit behind Bernie's, but I've also been working with Guat. With Guat, yeah. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, seeing as we're all self-promoting today, it's, uh, <laughs> Not it's, me. A it's a sequel to a book I wrote 10 years ago called Confessions of an Old Boy. So it's with this character called Dato Hamid. Mm -hmm. And so I have my approach to, to, to when I re create characters, right. and perhaps we can compare and contrast, that um, I've done a lot of work in theatre, and I haven't acted myself, but I've, I've, as a director, I've, I've worked with actors. And, you know, actors have to imagine that their character is the, is the center character of that play. Mm -hmm. And they have to inhabit that character fully mm -hmm. to, to almost to the, de the detriment and the absence of everybody else. So every time when I'm writing and I click into somebody else, then that person, I, I have to 
almost be an actor mm -hmm. and be, be that person. And, and that that person is the central character in their own story. And mm -hmm. they just happen to be intersecting at any given moment with another character mm -hmm. who happens to think that they're the, the centerpiece of the right, story. Right. So, I, I, that's my approach anyway with characters. Well, the, the thing is, I started writing um, Dell's POV from the first person. So I, I wrote, I think, 20,000 words and I chucked that out. And I just, because I decided that I needed to have more texture. So Omar and, and Marina's POVs are from the third person. So it's a combination of first person and third person, and it works. But I, it's, it's a bit unconventional. I mean, not, not, not all novelists do this. But um, yeah, so that's, that's, what I, that's what I ended up mm. doing. You know, I think one interesting challenge for many of us who are kind of middle class, care lights, who you know, speak in the English language, you know, is that we suffer from, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, from a deep sense of inauthenticity. And then when we want to create characters that are true to this place we call Malaysia or Kuala Lumpur, we always fight with ourselves about what that person should sound, should sound like, like yes, absolutely. right? Yeah. And you know, what their cultural references should, mm -hmm. should be. Should they be global? Should we always be talking about Paris and London and, and New York uh, or Tokyo even? You know, uh, and I say even because, yeah, we, we're still ambivalent about our Asian references. The, the question is, you know, is, was that a challenge for you, this inauthenticity? Dialogue. Yeah, the dialogue. Dialogue and, you know, is extreme. It's one of the hardest thing, things to write. Absolutely. Because the language of it, right? Oh, okay. Oh that, I mean, that it should be authentic. <laughs> And I think this yeah. is the thing. I mean, yeah. with such a multilingual space, I mean, I kind of disagree with you about KL being the most interesting place on, you know, a city and planet Earth. I, I think there are a lot of more interesting cities, but it is an interesting city because it's got people, and it's got people from around the world. It's got people like world. us. It's, yeah, and people like us who, you know, who struggle with mm -hmm. inauthenticity, which is actually a modern problem, isn't it? It mm -hmm. is a, well, problem, a global can, problem. It's not a specifically Malaysian problem. Can I problem. interject here and ask you a question, Sharad? Yeah. But before, but, because... Um, Sharad, Bernice and I, we, we've written fiction. You're, you're a writer, and we, I mean, you're doing a lot of broadcasting now, mm. so you haven't had much time, but you, you desperately want to. And <laughs> yeah, I have aspirations. You, and, and there's, and there's your, your mother who's written fiction, but you yourself, you're not really tempted so much by fiction, but you want to do non-fiction. Yeah, I'm very scared to say well, I why? have, because I do have a novel in yeah, me. So well, I'm sure you do. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, and and I, think that, I think it's a crazy thing, actually, to, to, to step forward and write yes, fiction. Yes, no, it's, it's, it's totally crazy. crazy. I, I, and I'm wondering, I, yeah, it's, Sherrod, it's very hard. do you... What, what's the reason why you haven't been able to make that step? Well, one, I'm very lazy. <laughs> Two, I have a, a crazy job at a crazy radio station that keeps me occupied a lot. And, you know. But I, I do think it's, it's all these challenges mm -hmm. you know, that come from yeah. uh, trying to find a way of telling the story in a language that I still, in some level, some part of my brain ha haven't accepted as being a Malaysian language, you know, and I think Saleh bin Jonat at one point said, you know, declared that English is a Malaysian language. It's, it's native to us now and we mm. should stop, you know, agonizing about it. But um, all these things and, and the fact that, you know, I think writing takes a huge amount of discipline. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. extremely proud of you for, you know, for, for, you know, not just attempting it, but actually publishing it. Well, and it took six years. To it took six years. And yeah. it's, it's it, in some years. ways, it takes a village to write a novel, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, well, you mentioned yeah. Guat, so she's the, the other villager. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to have to wrap this one up now, Bernice. Mm -hmm. um, but finally, you feel satisfied with your characters? Yes, I, 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 I uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I miss them very much. Like I said, you know, I wish that I could still hang on to them. But I do talk to them from time to time. I'm not a crazy person. Yeah. Um, but I do talk to them because I do believe that they're out there in the world. They, I, they are out there. They're still living. They, they have lives, and they've moved on from this, the terrible things mm. that happened to them in the book. So, yeah, they're okay. very much alive and well in, in my life. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, folks, you can, you can purchase uh, Once We Were There at any bookshop, good bookshop near you? Yes, it should be in all the major bookstores in Malaysia and Singapore by next week. You can buy it online from the Epigram Books website. And Pak Chong is uh, also here from Grok Budaya, which is our distributor in Malaysia. So Right, right. Go. I think we've <coughs> done enough promoting of your book for now, so we're going to move on. Uh, to the final part of the show, recommendations, where we recommend something that we think might be of interest, and I'm going to go first. My recommendation is, I've been away, I've been away. And uh, I was in England. And there was a, a I, the, this is a recommendation I've made before, but I'm going to make it again because there's a new season of this uh, comedy show um, called The Windsors, which is, it's, it's about, it, it, yeah, it's, it's the British royal family. So all these actors play them. It's incredibly rude. It's, <laughs> it's, 
it's, it's seditious. It's uh, treason, I think, even. But it's also kind of loving, and it's just very funny satire. I don't even know if it's satire. It's just a broad comedy mm -hmm. involving all the characters from the British royal family, except for the Queen herself. And it's just so rude. You must watch it. And it's called <laughs> The Windsors. So that's mine. And Sherrod? Well, uh, watching, uh, looking at that exhibit over there, it's an artwork about, about um, uh, moving a house. And this is actually something that's quite common to Southeast Asian homes. And it reminded me of a professor of mine of anthropology, Roxana Watterson, who wrote a book called The Living House, The Anthropology of Architecture in Southeast Asia. So if you're interested in sort of get going further, uh, uh, Watterson's book might, might help. And it also just reminded me of her, the curious young academic when I was at university, who would scratch herself red as she did her, you know, graduate uh, seminars with us because she was so nervous. She's now, you know, retiring. It tells you how fast time flies. But uh, anyway, it's, it's an excellent book. And the cover of the book includes um, an image of uh, people carrying a house. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, the, sub, uh, the, the, the mode of, of what actually happened in that particular artwork. And I can't tell you much more than that. Uh, but but there, so okay. Roxana Watterson. Because Sherrod keeps pointing at, at an actual house, uh, yeah, house I do. that is, Actually, that is being am. built here. But this is radio, and nobody right. else can see this. Right. Okay. Well, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm describing it. Uh, okay, so that's um, one more time. We'll do. Roxana Watterson's uh, The Living House, The Anthropology of Architecture in Southeast Asia. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And also reminds me of Luke, uh, Liu Kung Yu's work, mm -hmm. Chadangan Chadangan Unto Negaraku, that kind of looks at what homes and houses are and the way we embellish it and, you know, would use Doric columns and Ionian columns. And, mm. and he had this whole, I, I don't know if, how many of you saw that, an extraordinary work uh, built up almost in a kind of architectural fashion from photographic material, meaning uh, the actual photographs are cut and layered to give this almost three-dimensional look to these mural-like uh, works that, you know, stand maybe 20, mm. uh, 10 feet by 20 feet or 30 yeah, feet. That's Extraordinary that. works. If you ever get re-exhibited, yeah. you must catch it. Liu Kung Yu's Chadangan Chadangan Nagaraku, Proposals great. for My Nation. Yeah, they're, they're great. They're really great artwork. Uh, Bernice, what's your recommendation? Right. Um, also another British te television series. Um, it's called Last Tango in Halifax, uh, created by the wonderful Sally Rainwright, who did um, Happy Valley. Um, so it's set in Yorkshire, and it stars Derek Jacobi and Anne Reid, two sort of great British uh, veteran actors, who fall in love after not having seen each other uh, for 60 years. So they were sort of childhood sweethearts. One moved off to Sheffield, and the other one stayed in Yorkshire. And they find they are sort of reacquainted on Facebook. So their grandchildren put them up on Facebook, and they meet. They fall in love, and they decide to get married 24 hours after having uh, coffee. It's a wonderful story. Um, it stars Nicola Walker, um, um, brilliant Derek Jacobi. Sorry, Derek Jacobi. Yeah, because he was like one of the original, no, not the original, but he was a, he was a Hamlet, right? Yes. After yes, Olivier, yes. you think yeah. of Derek Jacobi yes. as being one of the great, great Hamlets. Actor. And they're all in their, so they're both in their 70s, and you've got this sort of co uh, uh, host of characters, really interesting characters. So he has a daughter, she has a daughter, and you know, there's different, as one's a farmer, the other one an, is an Oxford right. graduate. But it's just wonderful. Right. I mean, these two, incredible actors um it's uh, two seasons only okay. created by sally rainwright who also did happy valley yeah um, yeah so um happy valley uh i started watching yes. that it was not a happy story no no not at all, not at all <laughs> it was not at unwatchable all. it was so miserable yeah. so is this as miserable as that no no it's this no it's not it's it's again it's she says uh, the creator says this is her most personal story because it actually happened right. um to okay. to one of her parents so okay all right so that's um what, what's it, what's Last it Tango in Halifax. Last Tango in Halifax. Yes. Um, available from, from all your legal <laughs> downloading sources. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as indeed is the Windsors. So uh, that brings us to the end of this week's show. And uh, only remains me now to thank and congratulate and wish all thank the best. Thank you. And Bernice I, wish, Chorley. I wish you all the best with your book. Oh, yeah. yeah mine, mine will be out. Dot, at, dot, some dot. Point in time. at some point in time. <laughs> uh, it's looking more like next year now, but uh, it'll be, uh, it's done. It's done. It is done. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Sherrod Kooten. Always a pleasure, Cam. And myself, Cam Rustin. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please do so on our Facebook page where nothing happens. Um, <laughs> but do just join us because then you know you're in the company of other sort of like quiet people. <laughs> um, at, or uh, if you do want to, by the way, kind of uh, join us uh, on Facebook, 
if you if you have a, a, um, a page where you've never ever ever said anything, like and you've been there since like 2003, but you've never said anything, I'm going to say delete, because <laughs> I just don't know who you are. It just sounds creepy. If you've been on Facebook and you never say anything, that's a bit odd. Right. Yeah. Do you know I, what I mean? I don't think Facebook was created in 2003. Yet it was. Uh, uh, forgive yeah. me if I got my history wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, but, but otherwise, uh, Sharad is all over Twitter. Yeah. At Sharad Kutin. Bernice, where are you? Facebook. Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram. Yeah, very rarely. Yeah, me neither. And uh, and so and also, I'd like to th thank our audience who have bravely um, and very kindly stayed with us throughout, um, as far as the eye can see. And uh, and so that brings us to the end of this week's show. And please join us next week on radio uh, for a bit of culture, BFM eighty nine point nine. Oh, okay. I just, thank, thank you. And um, Ali, I forgot to say one thing, so I'm going to add it now, but we can put it in. Um, and we, and if you at home, uh, s sitting around your wireless, listening to a bit of culture, as I know you do, would like to hear a bit more, we have an extended version for podcast only, uh, where we will do a question and answer with embarrassed members of the audience. <laughs> And so, um, and so now, folks, thank you much for, for the podcast-only section where we would like to see if anybody has any questions. We, we won't take long, just five Comments, minutes. Maybe. Five minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, we have a, a microphone over here uh, to, to the side over there. If, if anybody has any questions. Um, uh, it'd be very embarrassing if nobody... Oh, we have somebody. Thank God. Oh. Oh, no, she's simply just holding the microphone, huh? That, that, that is embarrassing. <clears throat> um, just one person, please don't make me beg. Stand. Is it okay? Yeah. Stand up, sit oh, down. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Uh, hello, I just had a question. I was wondering, uh, do you have any more prospects with collaborations with art and cultural centers in radio? Because I think it's very interesting. I've never seen a radio talk in a cultural space or cultural setting in collaborations like this so well um we did do uh one show in singapore once uh yeah art stage 2013 art stage we were invited down and they paid for our hotels yeah uh, by uh, Li wing Choi, whose voice and, is in the, the and a per diem um and it was very good so yes we were always open to it and, and in fact you know sponsors if you're listening we're available for weddings <laughs> Birthdays, uh, circumcision ceremony, <laughs> celebrations, kids Perhaps ask somebody ask from the, the gallery might, might say something because uh, I know that the reason we're here is in some sense we are an artifact of contemporary culture. The BFM itself is an artifact. Uh, and we're not doing this primarily as a way of disseminating uh, debate and discussion about art in the space. We are actually, in some ways, an exhibit. Uh, like a, we're like performance artists, if you think of it that way. But I mean, the, if the gallery has something to say uh, about why they do this and what radio could do for the contemporary art scene, that would be... Uh, oh, well, I think Wang actually would like to. But, but just briefly, in fact, yeah, I mean, we're always open to, to, to doing more. We'd love to. Um, so Wang Choi. Hello, um, my name is Lee Wang Choi. I'm one of the co-facilitators for this project, the Ilham Contemporary Forum. Um, Chitu and uh, Azad are also here, and they're uh, some of the project curators. So unfortunately, Rahel, who's the gallery director of Ilham, is not present. And it really is her, her decision to bring these guys in. And I objected strenuously because they're just a bunch <laughs> of, well, you know, I'm speaking about Cam and, and, and Sharad because, you know, Bernice wasn't, uh, uh, isn't uh, really uh, a part of it. No, but I, I really do like um, radio as a format. And what is really interesting, I think some of, some of the things that your questions suggest is that when radio is not a visual medium and it, it compensates for the visual, it becomes really interesting. There's a podcast and I, I kick myself for not knowing what it is. It's um, blind people walking around describing things. Um, uh, you know, they, they go to exhibitions, and you know, there's, there are these discussions. Uh, people are describing the objects to the blind people, and they're sort of uh, interacting and interpreting what they're hearing. So 
there's so much sort of uh, potential when you when you mix the media when you think about radio and especially uh, visual arts. Of course, radio and theater have a, a very deep history and it's very very interesting there. So I think that's something that uh, you know it's 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 worked out really well. We're very happy. Um, thank you very much for uh, being part of the Ilham Contemporary Forum, and it's something that I think uh, Ilham would be very interested in continuing to pursue. You know, can I just kind of add to that? Uh, at Art Stage, where Wang had helped us to come to Singapore, I met a German artist, a curator, I believe, whose father used to do uh, an art show on radio in Germany. And uh, part of it was uh, that he would send uh, out of the show materials, you know. So this is partly art education, art appreciation. But you can't imagine it's happening on radio or, and some techniques. And so there was this kind of, you know, analog... Uh, style, uh, you know, interactivity that was going on. And I think, uh, you know, speaking for somebody who's worked in radio for some years now, um, and what BFM also doesn't do enough of, I think, is be in the world. We often have the world come to the studio, phone in, or actually be there as guests, but we don't go out to, to the world enough, and because that takes resources. But uh, as Bernice said, I mean, Kuala Lumpur is a fascinating enough city for us to send people out and to hear not just the English language spoken, but a range of languages and the new communities that make up the city all represented through uh, our station. We just don't do enough of that because of the resource constraints, yeah. but, uh, and the arts community and its work is one of, uh, one of those yeah. moments in the city that I think well, really worth I, uh, celebrating. I think we should, we should let uh, people go for good behavior, unless anybody, oh, we have one, one <laughs> final question from, and your name is, sir? <laughs> Kian Wong. Oh. How are you, Cam? Congratulations, Bernice. Thank you. I, I just wanted to put a little footnote to um, Wang to actually point out that actually, um, given that Malaysians are supposedly so pessimistic these days, that we should actually refer back Malaysians. to the boom years of the 90s and towards even the tail end of the Reformasi uh, crises, um, that um, there was actually a project which ran for nearly two years that maybe Sherrod is too modest to refer to Radic Radio, which... I am very modest. I know, <laughs> but, it, but it was actually very groundbreaking in the whole region. And uh, it produced um, weekly radio programs, podcasts before they were called podcasts, available online and broadcast in from Indonesia, available here, made by young Malaysians, over 20 of them. Uh, and among them have, were wonderful um, stories, all in Malay, uh, of voices. Has this been archived? Is it still uh, accessible? And this was all done 20 plus years ago. So mm, yeah. it's possible. Malaysians have done it. They can do it again. Uh, yes, Actually, less than 20 years ago, see, the early noughties. But, but yeah, definitely. And, and sir, can I just point out, you're so optimistic because you don't live here anymore. Yes, that yeah. is very uh, true. You, you, you live, run away. You live in Australia. <laughs> yeah, well, so, you know, just to also give some historical context to Kian Wong, he was the, oh, at one point the editor of Men's Review. We mentioned yeah. earlier another artifact uh, of, um, you know, the 1990s. He himself is now a fossil, like me, <laughs> uh, from the 1990s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, any we, questions? No, we, no, no. no we, I think we, we, must, we must wrap up because we, uh, we should always leave them wanting more, you know? And especially because there are no hands going up, so they don't want any more. Yeah. So, with that in mind, um, there's, there's we'll, no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk privately, sir. Okay? Um, but we, we'll wrap up now. Thank you very much again. And uh, we're still around if you want to talk. And Bernice's books are available in the foyer. Um, and, and the author will sign them herself if you, if you purchase three or more copies. <laughs> So thank you very much.